Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, at the Winter Show. Uh, my name is Helen Allen. I'm the executive director of the show. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, we very much appreciate your support of the show, of our dealers, and of course, of our charity beneficiary, Eastside House Settlement. Uh, the ticket admissions that you purchased to come to participate in this lecture uh, actually go to directly help uh, Eastside House uh, develop its programming and help those New Yorkers who are most in need. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be standing here with a dear friend and, uh, and colleague uh, for many years. Uh, ben is the, uh, the leader of Curious Objects, which is a fabulous podcast. If you're not familiar with it, you absolutely should be. Uh, I believe we're recording this for Curious Objects today too as well. Uh, and uh, this panel discussion is being uh, put on in conjunction with both uh, Curious Objects and our very longtime partner and sponsor, the magazine Antiques. So thank you very much, Ben, over to you, and he's going to take it away and introduce our speakers. Uh, well, <coughs> welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you very much, Helen, for that kind introduction. Um, and I also just want to say a, a huge thank you to the whole Winter Show team for putting together what is really a miracle of a show um, under challenging circumstances. You've done a beautiful job uh, making this happen. Um, it feels good to be back at the Winter Show. Um, it is such a pleasure to see you all here um, in person in this room. Um, I also want to welcome everyone who is watching this on Instagram or who is listening via the Curious Objects podcast. It's been about 90 years since the German philosopher Walter Benjamin uh, published his iconic essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Um, for anyone who hasn't read this essay, maybe since you were uh, an undergraduate, um, this was a transformative piece of writing which uh, you know, um, really changed uh, the way that artists and art historians and, and critics were thinking about a wide variety of subjects. Um, Benjamin observed that new technologies were making it easier and easier to produce and reproduce and uh, even uh, mass produce works of art. Um, he wondered what this change would uh, mean for the way that we create and experience art. Um, and he spoke of what he called an aura uh, that makes handmade works of art uh, compelling and meaningful. So 90 years on, here we are at America's greatest antique fair, and the dealers and the collectors here are true believers. Um, if there was ever such a thing as an aura associated with antiques, you will find it here. And that creates, I think, a, a great opportunity to talk about what is really going on. Um, where does that aura come from? Uh, what is that quality that makes your pulse race when you see or, or touch or hold a certain object or work of art? Um, how does craft assert itself in the midst of technological change? And how do we connect to the countless generations before us that developed not just ways of making things, but also ways of looking at and, and experiencing and loving them. Um, and in that endeavor, I am so pleased to be joined by three individuals uh, whose work is intimately tied up in those questions and those concerns. Uh, so to my right is uh, Roxanne Jackson. Uh, she is a New York-based ceramicist whose sculptures are wildly creative uh, and novel and, and surprising, um, even while they draw deeply on historical forms and techniques. Andrew Lamar Hopkins is a New Orleans-based artist uh, whose paintings give us provocative new ways of conceptualizing 19th century Creole society. And Abraham Thomas is the Metropolitan Muse Museum's curator of modern architecture, design, and decorative arts, uh, whose work often takes chapters um, uh, straight out of history books and smashes them right up against cutting edge ideas and uh, uh, criticism around curation, presentation, uh, and, and purpose. Now, we could spend a long time listing all of your various accolades, but 
um, I already have a feeling that we're going to find ourselves running out of time and wishing we had more at the end. Um, so let's just uh, get straight to it. For those who are listening via the podcast, um, we are going to be showing images throughout, which you can see if you go to the magazineantiques.com slash podcast. Uh, so I encourage you to follow along with the pictures there. Okay. Roxanne. Um, some of your recent pieces, and I'm going to see if I can juggle all of these various devices here. Um, some of your recent pieces draw explicitly on forms from antiquity. Uh, so the amphora vase, for example, features prominently. Um, that form, the amphora vase, must be one of the most recognizable decorative arts forms uh, in the world. Um, and I'm very grateful to you for recently pointing out to me that there is actually an emoji version of the amphora vase. Um, how did you land on that subject? The first amphora, oh, thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me to be here and nice to meet all of you. Um, the first amphora I made was I was invited to be in, in an exhibition at a, a ceramic conference called Insica. This is in 2014, and it was an interactive show. So to ask a ceramic artist to make an interactive piece, that's kind of like nail-biting, because you know, they're fragile objects. So I was thinking, of, but I like the parameters like to solve this problem. So the first idea, I thought, was to make a bong. But again, this is 2014, so I thought it was definitely too racy, especially for the ceramic conference. But that's a different project currently in the works. Stay tuned. So second idea was to make an amphora. And so I hand built a large scale amphora and I glazed it, section of it in blue and white. So blue and white, we think of the blue and white that comes from China, the cobalt painting on porcelain, or also the fake version that came out of Europe, Europe, um, the Netherlands and England specifically, and all around the world. So I kind of juxtaposed these two ubiquitous ceramic techniques, one in the form of the Greek pot, the amphora, and another one in this technique of the cobalt on porcelain. And I did that design on the front of the amphora vase. The rest of the vase I painted with black chalkboard paint, which is rule number one, you're not supposed to do this if you go to graduate school for ceramics, you don't put paint on your pot. But I did that, and then I sent this piece to the exhibition with blue and white chalk. So most of the vase is painted with black chalkboard paint, and then there's a stripe of the blue and white done in a flower mo motif in the front. So I was inviting the artists, or sorry, the audience to participate and color in the rest of the vase, which is inherently a failure because chalk is chalky, and it's not this beautiful, rich cobalt color of the glaze, or the white is not gonna mimic porcelain in any way. So this showed me like, oh, this is a great example of what I'm trying to do with ceramics often, which is to express and show dichotomies and polarities in work. For instance, lowbrow and highbrow, the reverent and the irreverent, like what I just described was a great example of that. Um, like the profane and the sacred, uh, the grotesque and the beautiful, the list, utility and absurdity, list goes on and on. So I realized that this was a great, I should continue to work with this vase to express these ideas, sort of like as a departure point for these ideas. One more thing, I also like working with this um, vase that's been made so many times because I feel like I'm connecting with all the artisans that have come before me and expressing this in a similar way, but through, you know, through my lens of the world. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I wanted to get at because this form, I mean, you mentioned it's the, the amphora is a, is a Greek uh, style of vase, uh, but vases of a sort of at least recognizably similar form go back six, eight thousand years. I mean, this is one of the longest lived forms in the decorative arts. Why do you think it's so successful? What do, what do people like about it? Well, one thing is that ceramics remains on planet Earth for thousands of years. Even if those pieces are in shards, when we fire ceramics, this is the reality. I think about this a lot. I'm also a professor of ceramics, so I talk about this to my students. There's a sense of responsibility when you work with this material because it will remain. And I only hope that 8,000 years from now, shards of this piece will end up in a museum <laughs> and people will be trying to figure out where it came from and who made it. Um, so the fact that the, there's physically it remains, I think really has an impact on us especially so many of the amphorae vases were decorated. They were telling stories. They were narrative pots. 
the red and the black figure showing, you know, depicting everyday scenes or special scenes of what was important to the culture. I mean, you know, maybe I'm doing that too in a different kind of way. So I think storytelling through this visual object that is made by the hands of a human being, I think we really, this idea resonates with us. Yeah, well, so talk about that process. Um, I mean, what are some of the, the sort of physical techniques and, and technologies that you use to produce these objects? And, and how do those compare with the ways that these pieces have been made over the, the millennia? Well, I think there's a lot of speculation about how pieces were made, but I think a lot of the Greek pots were made on the pottery wheel, and then other elements were hand-built on top. I don't use the pottery wheel because I'm just frankly not very good at it. I hand build techniques. One thing that I think is interesting about ceramics, obviously I think there's many interesting things about ceramics, if you can't tell, but is like there's only a certain amount of techniques. Even as technology develops, there's still like five techniques, maybe six. And so I'm still using techniques that many people throughout time working with these objects have built forms with, such as coil building or working with slabs. A piece like this I build solid and then hollow out. So again, I'm working with this, one of the most basic materials all around planet Earth, maybe the first art form, arguably the first art form, right up there with cave painting. And I am still using basically like old technologies to build forms. Yeah, uh, I, I love the lineage of that and the feeling that you participate in this ancient tradition. Um, but, but tell me about you know, the differences in the process um, that, that you go through when you're creating a, a, a piece like one of these uh, vases versus when you're working on a piece that seems to, to, um, to be, uh, shall we say, le a, a, a bit unbridled, that's um, less uh, directly grounded in uh, works, in historical works, historical inspiration. Uh, what are the differences in how you conceptualize those pieces and then how you actually execute them? Yeah, and that's a good question. I've been thinking about this. Like when I am building a vase form, I might have a loose idea of like, put a bird on it. You know, like maybe I want to make a vase with a cockatoo. Uh, oh, I already did one with a cockatoo, a toucan, whatever it is. I'll build the vase form, but then I have to actually like step back and look at what does the vase look like. I might be surrounded with some quick sketches, but ultimately for me in the studio, intuition dominates and spontaneity dominates. Even if I'm trying to follow a sketch, the process takes over and the piece might not look at the sketch at all in the end. So I have to like take that in. So I think of it like tabula rasa, this vase with nothing on it and I have to see like, does it need handles that break above the horizon line of the piece? I was gonna put a chameleon on it. Is the chameleon, could it be on top? Like what's the scale? How is it gonna fit with the form? So it kind of does provide like a foundation and a, a, like a departure point for the sculpture, which I like a lot. It's quite different than just free floating and, I'm gonna make a splayed animal head, which sometimes I make, and there's like, there's not a lot of grounding. I never know what those forms are gonna look like, where at least I know I'll end up with the vase, and who knows what's gonna happen. So there's a different kind, I'm just like grounded in something, which makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so, I mean, these are all unique, one-of-a-kind, handmade objects, but uh, do you think about um, the idea of reproduction, getting back to, to Walter Benjamin's essay, I mean, if it were possible to reproduce these pieces, um, you know, using 3D printing, for example, um, how would you think about um, the, the possibility of something like that? Well, um, sometimes I feel like I'm like a Luddite. I could be a Luddite when it comes to, I, I'm very into ceramics, so sometimes I'm resistant to two new technologies, but change is inevitable, so we have to take it in. So when I first, learned about 3D printing, I wasn't like super excited about it. Also NFTs was kind of like two thumbs down. But then I'm thinking about this more and I, I want to embrace all art forms, right? Because it's just an expression, so they all count. And the interesting thing about NFTs is maybe, I mean, I'm just gonna say that's like the newest way of making art, this digital form that only exists in the virtual realm. If I'm gonna make an NFT of my work, I want it to be of a, of a pot. I want it to be of like me referencing one of the most ancient art forms, which is the amphora vase. And funny, 
this is actually in process right now. I'm working with a gallery in New York called Room 57. Actually, Josh is here in the back. And um, we are in the process of making NFTs of the Flamingo Vase and 3D printed version because I think that's sort of full circle. If I'm going to make an NFT, I, uh, again, the newest technology, I want it to harken that to harken back to the oldest art form. I think there's a really interesting like tension in that idea. Yeah, fantastic. I love that. The, yeah, the oldest, the very oldest with the very newest. Um, Andrew, um, I want to move on and, and talk about some of your work for a moment here. But when I when I um, introduced you, I threw around the word Creole a few <laughs> times, um, and I wonder if you'd like to because uh, you know it's a word that different people use in different ways. Yes. Um, how do you think about the word Creole, or, or what's your definition? So, um, Creole is, is one of the most complicated words there is, because it, it's a word that evolved and changed over a period of time. A Creole could be people, a culture, a way of life. I, liked, I was a tour guide back in the day um, in the French Quarter and gave kind of historically accurate tours of architecture and how people lived. And I like to tell people, uh, Creoles um, lived, are the people from L uh, Louisiana's colonial past. So New Orleans was founded in 1718. The colonial period was from 1718 to 1803. So everybody that lived in Louisiana, uh, enslaved people, free blacks, Native Americans, as, and as well as the French and um, Spanish, well, all those people were considered to be Creoles. And Napoleon sold Louisiana in 1803. Americans started to flood in, and that word really meant something because it was like all of these people that were in Louisiana before the Americans came were Creole. They were Catholic. They spoke French. The French culture, we were French first and then Spanish. Um, even during the Spanish period, people continued to speak French and live as if Louisiana was Paris. Um, and so the Americans came in and things kind of changed. They were more interested in making money instead of having fun. And so the, you, it, it kind of began a separation of the Creoles, this group of people that were already in colonial Louisiana, and the Americans that began to come in. And the work that you do is, um, it's beautifully plain and honest. Uh, and Thank you. One of the things, and what we're looking at here is um, a, the, the cover that Andrew painted for the 100th anniversary issue of the magazine Antiques, um, except here there's a key to all of the objects that are included in, in the painting. So these aren't just haphazard slapdash, you know, pretty things thrown into a picture. <laughs> Um, they're all meticulously uh, researched. Um, you have a great historical understanding yes. of the context around all the objects that you include. And I'm wondering um, how much of that comes from your intuitive knowledge that you've developed over a lifetime of interest in, in this kind of material? And how much of it is specific research that you'll do for a particular painting? You know, what, what does that look it's, like it's, to you? It's almost 50-50 you know, in a former life, prior to becoming an artist, I've kind of always been an artist, I was an antique dealer. Um, and I kind of fell into being an antique dealer. I was a nerdy child that would go to the library after school and research architecture and antiques and would bother antique dealers in Mobile, Alabama, as well as Louisiana. And some of them wanted to teach me about antiques, which was a good thing. And um, so later in life, um, I didn't really kind of know what I wanted to do other than have beautiful things. And I realized, oh, I kind of know how to buy and sell antiques and make a profit and uh, know a little bit about it. And so I became an antique dealer at the age of 20 in New Orleans um, and, you know, kind of had to know a little bit about everything. So when I'm creating a painting like the magazine Antiques, I'm thinking, oh, I want a Rembrandt Peel still life in this painting, or I want a Windsor chair. And, you know, so I might go back and do a little bit more research and include that in the painting. So there are a lot of different ways of looking at, at the past, a lot of different lenses, different angles. Um, and, you know, the art historians and uh, curators and, and researchers they all work to bring that out in different ways. 
Um, but what is it in, in your work, you know, what is it about uh, this period in Louisiana history in particular that your pictures can help people like us to understand differently or see in a different light? Um, well, this, this period of the late 18th century through about the 1830s, which is the period I like to paint, I love the fashion of that period. Uh, in Louisiana, even in the earliest days of Louisiana, we had mud streets, but when outsiders would come, they would always say, you know, everybody is fashionably dressed with the latest fashions from Paris. They have silks, satins walking around, you know, on these muddy streets of, of us, of Louisiana. So I love the aesthetic of the clothing as well as the buildings. Um, Louisiana is very different from the rest of America, primarily because during the colonial period, we were never English. So the English influence had uh, um, a huge influence on the rest of the South as well as the rest of America. But because Louisiana had a French and Spanish influence, it's almost like a different a country. When you go to New Orleans, you see these beautiful arches, pastel bright colors, and people on the streets wearing the latest fashions from Paris. This particular painting shows a free couple, uh, free people of color, um, which were a group of blacks living in Louisiana during the time of slavery who were free. And this started very early on. Again, we were New Orleans was settled in 1718, and the first free blacks are 1721, 1722. This painting is about 1820, so by that time, you had people that were generations of, of free people of color who owned, uh, built real estate, owned buildings, and sold properties. So they had some money. Not everybody, but a, a group of them did. So. Your work has actually been widely reproduced. I had just mentioned um, the picture you did for the magazine Antiques. Yes. Thousands of copies. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you go upstairs to the third floor of the, of the show. I've been stealing them every day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so there are actually posters of that, uh, of that painting available yes. for, for sale. Um, wh what does it mean for you? How do you feel psychologically, emotionally? Um, when a, a, a picture like that is, that you've done is out in the world in thousands and thousands of, of iterations? Well, I'm greatly honored and flattered and, and actually humbled as well to, um, to, as a child growing up in Mobile, Alabama, um, again, I was this nerdy kid, not into sports or just doing what other children were doing. I was reading the magazine Antiques. <laughs> And learning about, you know, stuff that was old. So to me, I'm extremely honored and flattered to be on the 100-year um, issue cover um, and also humbled. Um, you've done some uh, pictures recently that um, take, take a bit of a different historical approach. I'm sorry, I don't have a reproduction of this one, but you've done a painting called... Um, the birth of Creole Venus. Yes, <laughs> um, which is uh, a um, essentially a reimagining of Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Yes, um, I wonder. Um, you, this is not a historical event no. per se. <laughs> um, apologies to any uh, uh, Greek pantheists <laughs> in the room, but um, uh, how how do you uh, um, approach? that sort of uh, project, which is, a, a, again, based in historical art in yes. this case, um, but, but depicting a, a mythological scene. So the way my mind works is, you know, that's, of course, the original is a beautiful painting, a very famous painting, but I like to creolize things when I see it. So when I see a wonderful, famous painting, I've even painted the Mona Lisa as Creole. So, um, of course, that's, the Birth of Venus is one of my favorite paintings, and I thought I always kind of wanted to imagine her being born in the muddy waters of Louisiana. And unfortunately, we don't have a picture of it, but um, that was one of the paintings I was quite proud of when I finished it because I just kind of reimagined it. And, and like I said, when I see 
art that I like, I reimagine those paintings uh, as Creole. And they may be mythological and not that historic. <laughs> yeah. Um, Abraham, uh, your turn on the hot seat. <laughs> um, so your position at the Met uh, is it, it, it's at the confluence of architecture, design, and decorative arts. Those are pretty broad areas. Um, and I, I wonder what you're finding uh, where those fields all intersect. Yeah, it's, um, hi everyone, by the way, lovely to be here. Um, I, I think one of the most fascinating things that I found in my role is just having the chance to delve into the collections through those three distinctive areas. And, you know, I, I often think about concepts like, um, you know, ornament and abstraction or craftsmanship and sort of histories of making, which I think apply at various scales and contexts in all three areas, whether it's architecture um, at a sort of larger scale, design or decorative arts. And um, I think for me what's fascinating also being at the Met is that there's a chance to look at that through the lens of 5,000 years of history and various cultural contexts. And it's actually, you know, quite, um, you know, it's, re it's really exciting to sort of see some of these common narratives emerge across these different um, areas of our collection. Um, and, you know, there are certain objects in our, our collection which I think really speak well to this. And, you know, we haven't got any images of this, but I, I just thought of this as you were asking the question. You know, we have, for example, these um, panels from the Normandy Ocean Liner, um, which, you know, in, in, on the one hand, they're extraordinary examples of full-scale architecture, because they're architectural fragments from one of the, you know, first-class dining saloons on the Normandy, but they're these, you know, beautifully reverse-painted glass panels, so there's an, an, an extreme level of craftsmanship and detail in terms of decorative arts. But then there are also these great examples of interior design as, as part of a holistic scheme, um, and, and, and it was, it defined a sort of lived, occupied, activated space. So I think all these, even that one object as a case study, I think speaks to, you know, how my role and the way in which we might develop these themes that might, you know, kind of um, grow in the future. Um, and, you know, actually the image we have up now is of um, three very distinctive kind of examples of period rooms at the Met. Um, and I think period rooms are, a, I mean, I'm, you know, having worked at the Sone Museum for a number of years as well, before, you know, before my time, here in the States, um, I've always been fascinated with the idea of period rooms and the roles they play in museums. But, um, you know, we have here um, an example of our most recent period room project, the Afrofuturist period room project. Um, you know, uh, the, our Renaissance um, studiolo and um, an 18th century Venetian bedroom in the bottom right. And I think these, they're all three very different um, notions of the period room, but I think period rooms themselves are such interesting examples of sort of tapping into the idea of architecture and a built environment, sort of lived spaces, but then also to a smaller, on a smaller level, object level, this idea of design, holistically, you know, you know described as design and um, decorative arts and objects. So I think period rooms are also these great case studies of all three of those areas sort of coinciding, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so, so we've just heard from Rox and, and from Andrew who are um, you know, two artists who are very much uh, conscious of the ways in which their work draws on uh, historical heritage, um, while, you know, at the same time pushing those traditions forward in, in various ways. Um, you know, to, to editorialize a little, it often seems to me that the, the, the best artists and the most influential artists are ones whose work manages to look backward and forward at the same time. Um, as, as a curator, is, is that a quality that you're conscious of and, and looking for? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when I think of contemporary artists and designers that we engage with or collect or, you know, collaborate with, it's um, what's most compelling for us is where these are artists and designers telling a, a new story, uh, whether that's drawing upon the past um, or creating something entirely new and radical. Um, and, and again, I think, you know, when I think about the Mets collections, there are so many opportunities for that type of sort of deep historical research and engaging with those, those various contexts. Um, and, you know, as a design and architectural historian, you know, when I think about the, um, you know, even the last 200 years of design history, it's been utterly defined by this idea of looking forward and back, whether that's, you know, the design reform movement in the 19th century in Britain, where 
architects and designers were looking to you know, the Islamic world or Indian design to sort of find a new vision for 19th century design. Or when we look um, in the 20th century, the sort of influence of um, medieval design on arts and crafts, for example, the idea of the guild and the collective, which became so um, influential on um, forms of making and material culture, um, or um, you know, the postmodern movement, um, you know, I've always been interested in as a sort of like, you know, intrinsically political and radical movement, but it was all about engaging with the past in a sort of, you know, on its own terms in a way, sort of like re-embracing ornament and decoration and color. And so that, that way of engaging with the past, which isn't just simply a, a sense of sort of, um, uh, you know, going back to the idea of the aura and Benjamin, like it's not simply this idea of like ritual worship, but it's about adapting and sort of like the idea of sampling and remixing, I think has come up in both, you know, with Roxanne and Andrew's sort of, um, talks just now, and that that uh, that idea of the remix and the sample um, to sort of reconfigure and sort of recontextualize, I think, is such a, a valuable tool for curators, historians, and artists and designers. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So there's, you know, it, it strikes me that there can sometimes be a pretty fine line between um, work that's historically inflected and inspired and and interesting uh, versus pieces that are sort of uh, derivative and old hat and you've seen it all before and it's kind of dull. Um, how do you, I mean, what do you look for in a work? What, what are the sort of characteristics that, that separate one from the other? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'm not just saying this, but I think Roxanne and Andrew are great examples of this. You know, what, what always stands out to me is when artists or designers, you know, have a real engagement with that history and that cultural context. Um, and sort of understanding their place in that sort of continuum of design or art or architectural history. And um, I think also the idea of, um, you know, really having an interest in the sort of histories of making and technique. And I think, you know, Roxanne, you, you also talked a lot about technique and, you know, in the context of ceramics, um, the, you know, the idea of, um, you know, sort of continuing and being a, you know, uh, cognizant of a tradition and, and series of techniques, but sort of adapting it to a sort of contemporary context and um, and seeing how those um, those various approaches to sort of craft history or design history apply themselves through this sort of um, you know embodiment of kind of of skill and labor in a, in an object or an architectural space. I think that's what's you know really, really interesting for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, to uh, to go back to to Benjamin's essay again for for a moment, you know, he, he made a great deal out of uh, what I mentioned earlier, this sort of metaphysical um, aura that uh, imbues a, a, a handcrafted work of art and, and distinguishes it from a mass-produced object. Um, at the same time, you know, at, at various points in the last century uh, or more of art history, you know, prints and multiples have sometimes taken center stage uh, in the fine art world. Um, of course, we're all familiar with the increasing, uh, or at this point, maybe maxed out already, uh, sort of mass production of household goods. Um, how, I mean, would you say we've sort of taken a wrong turn somewhere along the, the lines, or, or would you say that, you know, maybe um, uh, Benjamin made a mistake in the way that he fetishized this aura? H how, how would you think about that um, tension? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, like many of us here, um, who are here at the Winter Show and read Magazine Antiques, you know, I'm, uh, I care very much about the aura and the, the 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 idea or the definition of the original, whatever that might mean. Um, you know, because I think as a as a curator historian, the idea of you know provenance, for example, is really important. Like the uh, the, the the fact that these objects have lives and um, the fact that they sh they bear the the sort of the marks of the passage of time and um, and they uh, they had a significance in a particular location in a particular moment of time, that those things are, I think are really important. Um, otherwise I wouldn't be working in a museum, frankly. Um, but at the same time, when I read Benjamin, I think what's really kind of fascinating and kind of quite radical and political about his, this idea of the aura is that he's almost embracing the idea of um, the impact of technology on this idea of reproduction. And I think, you know, Andrew, you mentioned the idea of sort of dissemination, the fact that, you know, you saw these images in the, in the magazine Antiques, for example, um, and your work now is being reproduced. And when Benjamin talks about um, sort of mass popular dissemination, I mean, he talks about, I mean, he presented radio shows in the 20s for children, and he talks about the advent of cinema and the idea of a communal experience. Th those, those aspects, I think, are, 
uh, where he's sort of really embracing the idea of reproduction as being for this kind of common social good. And, um, you know, having worked somewhere like the, the V&A, for example, you know, I always think about um, the idea of, you know, the, that, that museum's history of, um, like, the, the the cast collection, for example, and the cast courts, which were these full-scale plaster reproductions of architectural spaces, and um, also having thousands of electrotypes, which were you know, copies of, of objects. And that, those were both sort of, to some extent, um, examples of technological advance, but there was this educational remit, and it was about inspiring artists and designers and the general public. And so uh, I think that's where the idea of the aura, um, you know, it's, it's kind of okay to debunk the idea of the aura the, and the original, because what is the true value of that object if it's being, you know, it, yes, there may be an original that had, uh, you know, a specific context, but um, especially when we, you know, work in cultural institutions, the idea of the dissemination and the kind of reception of that, I think, is equally, if not more, um, important. Um, and then I kind of, you know, I also mentioned period rooms because, um, this idea of the authentic, I think, comes up a lot with period rooms because, on the one hand, I mean, the Afrofuturist period room, which we opened at the Met last November, was in a way a kind of comment and a critique on the idea of that there's no such thing as an authentic period room because, number one, the idea of a period doesn't really exist because it's not a single second and a minute in time. It's layers of history, and as curators, we often you know, we, we're often speculating often like what, what objects existed and what permutations and were any of these objects actually original to that specific room and that specific moment in time. And so there's always this sort of slightly theatrical, as you can see with the Studiolo and the, and the Venetian bedroom, theatrical aspect of these rooms. Um, they're sort of stage sets in a way. And so um, there's, I think, the idea of embracing a period room as not necessarily being like authentic in that sense is I think very productive and sort of interesting. Um, and so that's where the idea of the aura, I think, can be questioned. And then also, of course, um, you know, seeing, um, you know, how many examples there are of period rooms that have been taken out of their original context. You know, we have so many examples of the Met and the, the V&A, we had many examples of, um, uh, you know, historic house collections that have been dismantled. And so, you know, you, you, you think to yourself, well, what... Um, you know, what, what is the authentic aspect of this room? Is, is, it, is it the fact that these are some original panels and sort of flooring and some objects? Or, um, you know, would it have been more valuable to actually create a perfect facsimile in the original building or to reconstruct the building so people understood the full holistic context? Because when you take a period room out of context, that's completely dismantling the aura, as it were. Um, and so, and that's why, you know, one of the other examples I included in these images were, you know, the work of um, the F Factum Foundation um, based in Madrid who create these extraordinary facsimiles of historic objects, whether it's the, um, the, the sarcophagus of Seti I, um, or this, this example, which Ben, you have up now, which is the, the painting by Veronese of the wedding at Cana. And um, they created um, this extraordinary reproduction, which wasn't just in terms of the image, but actually the, the sort of physical qualities of the surface of the paint. So it was a, you know, a, a, a kind of laborious combination of um, high level digital scanning and kind of a combination of digital fabrication and, and sort of hand built kind of additions. And, the, what's powerful, I think, about this is this idea of the aura, because most people go to the, they, who see the painting in the Louvre, they, most people actually are sort of focused on seeing the Mona Lisa, which is on the opposite side of the wall, so most people kind of walk past it. But that, that you know, Napoleon took this painting, you know, centuries ago from this refectory at San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, and, and so the idea was to create this facsimile and to bring it back to its original context. So, um, and Adam Lowe, the head of the Factum Foundation, often talks about these amazing facsimiles being not necessarily copies, but sort of almost like performances of an object. And so that's what I think is so interesting about this idea of the aura and the authentic. Like, which, which of these is actually more authentic? Is it the, the copy that you wouldn't, actually to the naked eye, could tell which, which was the real thing? Or is it the painting that's in the Louvre? Because it literally was Veronese's painting. And that, I think that opens up so many interesting and provocative philosophical questions for us. Yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, as soon as you start talking about authenticity in the context of the market, you create a whole new rabbit hole that, that we could dive down. Um, but, I, but I wanted to, um, to uh, put a couple of questions to uh, any or, or all of you, um, just thinking a bit broadly about the, uh, the place that we're in, um, in terms of art history, in terms of art creation. Um, what are the, the technologies that are new to the world or that are just being developed right now that um, that you 
already know or that you suspect are going to have the most significant influence on the way that you do your work, whether that's uh, creating art or whether it's curating, thinking about it. Well, what are some of the um, uh, the changes that you think? Are, because you know, technology, of course, is always inherently bound up in the way that art is produced, and that's always been the case. Um, but but today, right now, what what is happening in the world of technology that's having the strongest influence on what you do? And I'll, I'll sort of let any or, or all of you who'd like to, to say something on that. Well, I already mentioned that I'm having an NFT made of one of my pieces and also a 3D printed image. And it's interesting to think about and talk about the aura because I'm like, is it gonna be in these objects? Probably not, but does it really matter? So that's, I'm doing that more as, uh, I think it's an interesting exercise. I don't know how seriously I'm thinking about this NFT or the 3D printed, which will be smaller and it won't be ceramic and, I, you know, it would be interesting to see what it looks like. But I, again, I just think it's kind of a fun exercise, but my expectation is that it won't be as significant. I mean, definitely it won't be as significant as the original and probably won't have that aura. And the white hand in here, um, I think this is, maybe I'm getting off topic, but it goes back to the aura and I kind of want to talk about this because I think this is really interesting. The white hand, this was in a show and, um, this woman, Andrea Scott, wrote about it in The New Yorker. The show was called Fur Cup, you know, based on that piece of art. And one thing that she wrote about my work was some, this piece in particular was something to the effect of that this decorative object was a great example of, I sent you the quote, I don't, I'm paraphrasing, that art has to do with spirit, not with decoration. That's what she said about this piece. Um, and I thought that that was like the greatest compliment because it is so highly decorated, um, literally bejeweled, and also a candle holder, so based on utility, also absurdity, like I talked about earlier. So the fact that somebody picked up on the fact that this is really about spirit, not decoration, I just felt like, oh, I guess that that's coming through, because I do think about this thing, but it's hard to define. You know, it's like, maybe it's in some pieces more than others, so I'm off topic, but packing on to previous things that were said. Um, yeah, so the new technologies will be part of kind of my work, side note, in the margins. And I'm just kind of curious to see what that will, what it will be like to have an NFT of a vase. Yeah, yeah if I, I'll just jump in as well. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned NFTs actually, because I think it is such a provocative, kind of fascinating topic. And I, I have a lot of healthy skepticism about NFTs as well. But the, um, uh, the, the, one of the things I, I, I thought was so in, uh, m most interesting about NFTs was the fact that because they're based on blockchain technology, there's this kind of encoded idea um, through the distributed ledger of the uh, you know the idea of the original because they literally cannot be another, and that's li you know there's, you could create a kind of copy as it were, and you could have uh, Beeple's NFT hanging in your room, but it, you don't own the original because it hasn't got that sort of digital sort of certificate or, you know, uh, to paraphrase. And I think that is interesting, even though it's a digital, non-tangible, non-physical object, yeah, it, it, they've literally go, gone all in on the idea of literally defining um, which is the original, which I think is kind of an interesting model in thinking about what 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 is the original, the, the first. Um, and, and, you know, and, and there are a lot of these NFTs that sort of continue a tradition of digital generative art. And that kind of also makes me think of another technology, which I think, uh, you know, especially in design and architecture is becoming more and more prevalent. And that's the idea of kind of um, artificial intelligence and the way in which that kind of guides design. So it's, and, and so it makes me think about the awe in the sense that, you know, often when we think about the awe, it's the mark of the maker. And so in a world where, you know, uh, design is becoming much more collaborative between like, you know, a bunch of humans who are designing something and uh, a series of algorithms which are sort of finding the most efficient engineering ratio or a kind of facade treatment. Um, who is the maker and what, how, and so that, that idea of the aura and kind of authenticity comes up a lot, I think, when I think about AI's in potential impact on design in the future. That's, so that's something that I There's, yeah, there's an intriguing about. idea that um, I've seen bandied about by certain auction houses around NFTs, which is to use uh, an NFT actually to carry forward information about a particular physical object. 
So it's, it, there's no pretense that you own the object by owning the NFT. It's not even really exciting to own the NFT, just that uh, the NFT gives you a vehicle to add information as the object passes through the world and changes hands as you learn more about it, as other people own it and collect it and donate it to museums and, and whatnot. Um, I haven't seen a very strong use case for that yet, but um, uh, I, I hope people continue to explore that because it sounds like quite an interesting idea. Um, on the flip side of that coin, I've been asking about technology, um, but we've also been talking about uh, history. And uh, I wonder if, um, if you'd like to speak about a historical idea or a historical technique or even a, uh, an art historical philosophy or approach to thinking about art um, that you would like to see more of in today's world that has maybe been um, uh, unfairly uh, left um, on the wayside. I'll chime in. Um, <laughs> So, speaking of the amphora, these were containers for food. These decorated, decorated beautiful objects that are still significant today held olive oil, wine, grain, etc. So, I think, wouldn't it be amazing to s use less plastic and start use ceramics in this way? So, I think bring that historical philosophy back. So, not just for the art world, for the world at large. Fantastic. We, uh, <coughs> you know, we always tell our clients to use the pieces they buy from us because, after all, that's what they were made for. <laughs> um, and if you don't, well, it's sort of like sucking the soul out of out of the thing. It, it's like the analogy I make sometimes is like, uh, you know, closing Notre Dame to worshippers because it's too important as a historical work of architecture for people to enjoy it for its original purpose of worship. Um, it would be a bit of a sad thing. Similarly. Um, it's a bit of a sad thing to see uh, people buy a, a tankard and never uh, pour a, a glass of beer into it. So <laughs> Any other thoughts on the historical ideas that you'd like to see people pay a little more attention to these days? Maybe I'll go to my <laughs> um, uh, I, I I mean, one, one, something I often think about, um, you know, in terms of the design of buildings, you know, when I think about like the 19th century, which sort of was the start of the, the sort of specialization of the architect, you know, when we, when we look back, you know, centuries, there was this idea of, you know, master builders or masons and the fact that um, architects weren't just designers of buildings, but they were, you know, they, they, they cared about all the details of every single aspect of, 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 of their constructions. And I think there's something about, and this kind of connects with another historical idea, which might be a sort of useful idea for the future, the idea of the sort of the guild or the, or the sort of collaborative, the collective of designers. Because, um, you know, often we, you know, with the nature of sort of architectural procurement now, you know, a designer is involved at a certain stage, but then things like the handrail and the doorknobs, they all, they all get specialized off into other areas and it becomes, um, you know, it's a, such a distributed kind of form of design as that, it, we, that one could argue that we've kind of lost that idea of every single detail being thought of by like a single group of people in a sort of collective or a guild type way, um, as was more common, you know, centuries ago. So, um, and that's sort of like the idea of the tactility and the quality of those materials and that sort of, again, it goes back to that question you asked about architecture, design and decorative arts being this unified thing. The, the idea of um, all, you know, ev every level of detail being thought of with the same care, whether it's the building or the, the things you touch, the tactility, that kind of would be, I think would be an interesting thing to sort of provide maybe. If, uh, you know, look incidentally, back at what are we past. looking at here? Sorry? I said, incidentally, what are we looking at here? Oh yeah, so the, <laughs> this was um, <laughs> my, my sort of like provocative final slide, which was, um, this, is a, this is a sort of placeholder image for this idea of the metaverse, which I think is you know, perhaps ref relates to kind of your earlier question, Ben, about new technologies. And, um, you know, I, again, like NFTs, I have a lot of healthy skepticism about the metaverse and what it even means. And no one seems to be clear about what the, the definition is. But the idea of, um, you know, having this sort of, uh, 
digital world where we might um, you know, occupy for part of our lives? What does that mean for architects and designers and, and objects? Um, you know, and I often think about, um, you know, when even in, in the early days of the internet, people thought, well, what, what, what is going to be the final culmination of this? What's the purpose? How, how does design have a part in this? And when it, the internet was, or the World Wide Web rather, was much more text-based, no one could have imagined like a world of sort of like mobile technology and sort of having the internet on the move or having streaming or video. And so I think the metaverse sort of offers a similar kind of interesting proposition in terms of what does it really mean? Is it something that really derives from gaming culture? Is it somewhere where we can actually um, you know, find other ways of collaborating and community building, for example, um, and you know, uh, you know what, 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 yeah, what, what does this mean for us in terms of like the physical object or the original object or the aura, for example? And I think this, um, this, this sort of new, new, uh, these new possibilities, I think, are kind of something interesting in the sort of design and architecture context. But yeah, I don't know if either of you have thoughts about the metaverse or about these sort of worlds of online living. <laughs> I have no thoughts about the metaverse, but I just remembered, I just want to share this story. I've been to India and um, thinking of like the containers, the ceramic, I bought a cup of tea more than once from a street vendor and the cups were thrown on a makeshift wheel and the clay wasn't fired. So it was just air dry clay and hot tea was put in it. So you, people were drinking tea out of this cup that was just basically just dried mud, dried clay. If you held onto the cup of tea for too long because it wasn't fired, the cup would literally disintegrate in your hand. And then when you were done, people would just toss it on the street. So we should also bring that back. I like that idea. And, uh, and the metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me think of like, like, uh, <laughs> like with, with what you said earlier, Roxanne, about fragments. It makes me think of... Um, like the like clay pipes, like the fact that you know clay pipes that often get like broken and, and, and crushed, and they they they're such an interesting sort of slightly ephemeral example of kind of clay and ceramics being used in a, in sort of especially in an archaeological context and sort of yeah. you know like trawling the side of the River Thames and finding these kind of 18th century examples of clay pipes and yeah. It reminds you of your India story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I also recently did a piece. I'm sorry if I'm dominating this, real quick made out of um, 850 pounds of wet clay. I did a, it was not fired, um, like an ephemeral piece. Speaking of ephemera, I invited some friends to make an object. It was based on like vanitas, still life painting, so traditional, so there was lots of vessels, but there was also, it was just all brown clay on a two-tiered platform with kind of stalactite forms and candles, but all done with clay, skulls, and then I invited people to come and make objects, so it was this like kind of ongoing, very collaborative, but also ephemeral piece that at the end I literally smash things with a hammer and dust to dust, let it go. Wow, all right, well, um, yeah, I, uh, that piece must have had a hell of an aura by the, <laughs> by the end. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Uh, again, Abraham Thomas, Andrew Lamar Hopkins, Roxanne Jackson, I appreciate your time and, and your thoughts. Um, thank you again to Helen and to the Winter Show team also to the magazine Antiques. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, the show is open, so go find something with an aura uh, and bring it home with you. <laughs> thank you all. Thanks. I think uh, there's a Normandy panel on five. There is, yeah, I saw, I saw there's a Normandy there. panel on five, and Andrew Lamar Hopkins' work is also available upstairs. So please, and next year we'll get you here. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so please enjoy and thank you all for coming out. <laughs>